Our first speaker is going to talk about the best practices for crack sealing and crack filling. It's Greg Sharp. He's with Craft Coal. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to come and talk with you today about crack sealing. Most everybody's favorite subject, right, in this room? <coughs> going to talk about um, a little bit about specifications. Going to talk about sealant properties, climate, how that affects your choices for sealant. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about installation in different configurations. So specifications, there's lots of different specifications out there. Agencies have their own, manufacturers have their own, the states always seem to have a specification. And then there's a couple of uh, governing outside bodies that also develop specifications that we go off of. One of them is ASTM, which is the most common one. And that is a group of industry engineers that get together regularly and talk about specifications. The other one is the AASHTO, which is the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, which is a group of local industry experts also. Um, AASHTO has adapted all the ASTM specs for crack sealing, so the specifications are the same, it's just the numbers a bit different. In ASTM, the ones that I'm mostly familiar with, it's a D6690, then there's a type 1, 2, 3, and 4, and in AASHTO it's an M324-01234, but they're all the same spec. One of the key points I'd like to make in, in right here is that a lot of times cities won't have their own specification. And they'll, a lot of times, will just adopt whatever the state is using because, hey, if it's good enough in Oregon for the state of Oregon, it's good enough for Gresham or it's good enough for Portland. The state does really a lot of specifying and looking at specs, and they go to a lot of the times the ASTM specs because of the road conditions that they have, the traffic, the, the traffic counts, the weights, and they need the flexibility that I'll show you in a little bit on the ASTM requirements. The city, by adopting the state, really should, I mean, it might be okay for you as a city, but it really needs to be looked at individually for the city and the kind of streets that you have, the kind of traffic patterns that you have, and, and you really need to look at that and not just adopt the state. You ought to really take a good, serious look at what was going to work best for my city. There's five or six different properties of sealant, characteristics of sealant that make up crack sealant. Uh, we're going to talk about five of them because those are the ones we normally look at to determine how that sealant is going to perform on your streets. The first one is adhesion, and then there's high temperature stability, which is softening point, uh, low temperature flexibility or elongation, elasticity, and viscosity. <clears throat> so as far as adhesion goes, this is part of the ASTM testing. So there's a hundred different sealants that, that we manufacture and everybody manufactures a lot of sealants. A lot of them are based on specifications. We have our own specs. States come up with their own specs. This is all part of the ASTM. Is, is a bond test is required on the ASTM and the type of sealant that is a 1, 2, or 3, or 4, uh, the 6690 type 1, 2, 3, 4 really surrounds around this bond test. And so they take these concrete blocks, they put an inch of sealant between them typically, and they cool it down to whatever that desired temperature is. So for ASTM 6690 type 1, they want to put that in the freezer and cool it down to zero degrees Fahrenheit in the freezer. They bring it out and they give it an extension. It's a one inch of sealant sample and it's a 50% extension. And then they let it come back on their own in one day and then they pull it again. They do it five times for the type 1. And it has to stay adhered to the concrete blocks and it can't separate at all or split down the middle. <clears throat> and then for the type two, they do the same thing, but they cool it down to minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Type three is pretty much the same as the type two, but then when they're done, they take it out and put it in water and submerge bath test it. And then they put it in an oven and artificially age it and give it a resiliency test. And that really is only used in federal specifications. It's the only time I ever see the type three used. Type four is a really cold test. It is a half inch sealant sample. So half the material of the type one, two, three, four, they cool it to minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit and then they stretch it 200%. So they're asking half as much sealant to go four times farther. And that's the kind of sealant and, and they have a different cone penetration requirement on it where um, the type one, two, and three can only have a max of 90. Uh, the type four can go clear to 150. So it's a very soft sealant. And I'll show you here in a bit why that's important to know. So the other adhesion test is a tensile adhesion or elongation. Same type of a test, but on this one, they just pull it once and they pull it to failure. 
And typically you're gonna see adhesion of about 400 to 600, sometimes as high as 1500%, depending on the sealant that we manufacture. If somebody calls me up and says, hey, I, my, your sealant failed, it's cracked. I'm gonna to wanna to know one question. Where did it crack? Did it crack along the edge or did it crack down the center? If it cracked along the edge, it's the picture on the left, it's an adhesion failure. It means it didn't adhere properly to the sidewall of the crack of the asphalt. Typically, that's an installation error or problem where it just didn't get clean enough to get good bonding. The other uh, adhesion problem is a failure, is a cohesive failure. A cohesive failure is where you can see that crack sealant is attached to both sides of the, con of the asphalt, but it cracked right down the center. That's usually caused because that asphalt, that con the crack sealant, I'm sorry, is not flexible enough for the amount of movement that that surface um, re required. The other situation that can happen in something like this is you look at that crack. Keep in mind for crack sealant to be effective, crack sealant needs a crack that's at least an eighth of an inch wide to penetrate into that crack. So if you've got narrower than, a, than an eighth of an inch, the sealant's not going to really penetrate through. And then as you can see by that picture that they've, they've put it in place, they've squeegeed all the excess off, which just left a very thin film over the crack. And so if there is any movement at all, there's just not going to be enough sealant to adhere or, or, or stay bonded. Some of the problems with adhesion is if there was a 10 commandments of crack sealing, the first two commandments are going to be clean and dry. We, that, crack sealant will not stick to, to moisture. It will not stick to anything, to dirty pavement. It'll stick to the dirt just fine, but it's going to adhere itself to the first thing it comes in contact with. Also, you've got weak and deteriorated pavement where you've got a crack and that crack that the surface is oxidized and you just don't have a good surface to bond to. Uh, also, you've got cracks that were previously sealed that you want to just go over and reseal them and the new crack sealant is only going to stick to what it comes in contact with and if that's old sealant, it's not necessarily the best scenario for a, a, a new job. So another test is, uh, and, and this is all part of ASTM testing. Not all sealants get that bond test. Only really sealants designed for that ASTM materials get a bond test. It's part of the ASTM specification. The other one is a high surface, a high temperature softening point. Uh, this is a ring and ball test, and that the, the tub below is filled with either glycerin or water. Um, that that uh, brass ring is, is hollow at the bottom and they put a disc of sealant between it and then they put a 3 8 ball on top of it. They submerge it into that water or glycerin, they bring it up to temperature and they measure at what point that sealant gets so soft that the ball drops through it. And that's the softening point. Now, softening point is a real critical value when you're talking about hot climates. Because remember, the higher the softening point, and the softening point is that point at which crack sealant will turn from a solid form back to viscous, at what point it starts to retactify, become tacky and sticky again. So in hotter climates, we want a, a higher softening point. Now, the bond test and the softening point are at two opposite ends of the spectrum. So a material with a real high softening point usually doesn't have a real great flexibility ability to it. And, various, and just likewise, sealants with a real um, good flexibility has a lower softening point. So you can't design a sealant that works well at both ends of the spectrum. <clears throat> okay, so this is a picture of what can happen when you have uh, too low of a softening point in, in a hotter climate. There's, there's two problems with this picture, but that's one of them. You can see all the tracking that's taken place from tires rolling over that. The other problem I see with that, we all see with that, is there's too much material applied there. You might think we really like seeing a lot of material go down, but we don't. We want to see it kept clean and on the crack, and we like to see good work. That's what really makes it look good for the industry. So some of the troubleshooting that we see with tracking is uh, excessive application. They open traffic too soon. Don't let it close long enough to let that material really set up. The pavement temperature is higher than the crack zones designed to withstand and um, or also incorrect for the traffic conditions. Now also if sealant is overheated or underheated, you're not gonna get good bonding. So we like to see crack sealant go down at, we, we like to set it up about 400 degrees, but we wanna see it between 385 and 400. And you can tell when sealant goes down too cold 
It doesn't bond well. It just, it'll go down and just lays there. It doesn't move. When material gets up to the right temperature, you, first off, you'll see this white smoke coming off the top of the sealant. That's a really good look when you see that because you know the sealant's going down at the right temperature then. And you'll see that sealant go down and actually move and flow into the asphalt. Low temperature, sealant properties, low temperature. If we don't do a bond test on sealants a lot of times, but we still want to know what the flexibility is going to be like, um, we do a flexibility test. The flexibility test is a 1 8 inch thick sample, 1 inches wide by 4 inches long. That's that black strip you can see them laying between their hands there. And they lay that over a 1 inch mandrel or pin and they bring it down to whatever temperature they want to test it at and then they bend it around that mandrel, that, spec that um, specimen around that mandrel, 90 degrees typically in 10 seconds. That'll tell you how flexible, and, and we measure sealants sometimes down to 23 degrees. So when do we want to know flexibility versus um, an ASTM bond test? We don't bond test everything. The only thing we do a bond test on are ASTM type materials. So I like to look at sealants in three different classifications. It just makes it easier for me. Um, there's our real stiff sealants that are very specialized. They are for hot climates where you get big, huge hot days like Arizona, you get down into Las Vegas, they get really high temperatures. You want a high softening point for those areas. Um, you don't really need the flexibility. It doesn't get that cold down there to have huge temperature swings and the freeze thaw cycles, but it just, it does get hot. So you want a high, a high uh, softening point for those materials. Then there's this group in the middle that you need some flexibility for it because you do get some temperature variation. You do get some movement in your cracks. You don't get real hot temperatures, so you want to kind of balance it between a high softening point and some flexibility. That's where this test really comes in handy, so you know how flexible that sealant is. And then the materials that are ASTM that go through the bond test, those are really reserved for climates that have a, the deep freeze thaws, a lot of movement. In Oregon, for instance, and Washington, we have a really nice dividing line between what sealants we use. If you're, dividing, if you're designing crack sealants for the Willamette Valley, it's pretty easy because we get a cold day of what, 30 degrees in the morning, and it'll warm up maybe 10 degrees on any given day. That's not a lot of temperature change. It's not a lot of temperature swing. We don't see a lot of movement in cracks in the valley. So it's pretty easy to design sealant for those. We tend to like to stick with these sealants that fall in this middle, middle group. Go to Nevada or go east of the Cascades where Nevada, Reno is famous for big cracks and lots of movement. It'll start out at 10 degrees in, in, on any given morning in the wintertime, and it can warm up to 50, 55 degrees by lunchtime. So you've got a swing of 40 degrees in a four or five hour period. They have huge cracks and a lot of movement in their cracks, and they need that flexibility. So sealant properties in low temperatures. Uh, this is one of the main tests that you look at for any crack sealant is the cone penetration. You're, you guys are all used to this industry, the asphalt industry. Everybody know what cone penetration is? Yeah, yeah. They, they had a cone, they have a pin, they have needles. We use this 150 gram uh, cone. Sink, we cool the material down to 77 degrees typically and sink that cone in there. And the dial indicator indicates how soft or how hard that material is. Now, so any sealant that, um, the softer that material is, the deeper that cone sinks in and the higher the number is on that, on that dial indicator. So for the three different types of sealants that I was talking about, or the three different families, you're not gonna find this anywhere, it's just something I dreamt up when I couldn't sleep one night. You're gonna look for a cone pen of about, if you see a material that's got a cone pen of like 45 or less, that's a pretty stiff material. That material is going to have a very high softening point, it's gonna have limited flexibility. The material in the middle that gets a flexibility test is going to range from about 50 to about 65. If you see that on a, on, and, and everybody lists cone penetration on their, on their data sheets. That's a material that falls in that middle where it's probably going to have some flexibility and they're going to show you what the flexibility number is. And then sealants that are higher than that are usually designed for ASTM test materials and usually have that bond test associated with them. Elasticity is a test that measures the rebound of a sealant, the resiliency of it. 
Viscosity is a machine that measures how thick or how viscous the material is, and we do make materials of different viscosities for different applications, like for slopes, and so the material doesn't just run out of the uh, crack. So what are the, the climate factors we've kind of talked about already, how that influences crack sealant. The colder the weather is, the bigger the freeze-thaw cycles, the more flexibility, the, the bigger your cracks are going to be, and the more movement you're going to have in those cracks, and you need a product that has more flexibility to it, versus uh, a place like Arizona that gets really hot, and you need that higher softening point. Crack sealant is really only good between an eighth of an inch to an inch and a half. After an inch and a half, we really recommend other products. We have a, a mastic. Everybody makes a mastic material that has an aggregate in it. So some installation techniques. I don't really want to go over that too much. Routing is a great option for people. You can see the longevity you get. You can see the longevity you get out of um, crack sealing and routing versus just an overband. So crack uh, routing has a great benefit to it. You double to triple the life of, of your efforts. So remember, when you're crack sealing, it needs to be clean and dry, no dampness, no discoloration, and it really needs to be clean. Cracks need to be blown out. If it's below 40 degrees, they say you can still crack seal, but you want to use a heat lance. If the temperature for that pavement is too cold, then um, it might not bond all that well. There are some different cleaning techniques. There's a, there's a crack back that's out now that came from Maricopa County, Arizona, where they don't allow anything to be blown into the atmosphere, so there's a vacuum that vacuums it out. Talk a little bit about application. We've got flush fill if you want to just do a route and then this is really what we also call this a concrete tip because it, you know you want to just do a flush fill on concrete. We have a disc, that ap applicator disc that puts it down, puts it down narrower but thicker and it's great because it eliminates uh, your crew size. You don't need a guy on a squeegee. We kind of overuse this sometimes if a, a agency is going to go right behind you and put down a surface treatment. Sometimes we really recommend squeegeeing it, getting it, all the excess material off the crack and getting it really flush. And then there's the squeezy application. You can kind of see the picture there where it's, the disc is putting it down nice and narrow but thicker and then the squeegee is just, it widens it out but it also flattens it out. And then um, there's detactifiers that get used in areas of conflict where you can't keep the road closed long enough and um, spray it on and it's an instant bond release so you can inst open it up to traffic instantly. We used to see this a lot in intersections where you can't close the whole intersection down, in driveways where you know you're not going to keep somebody from parking his car in the driveway so they use DTAC in front of it. That's it for my presentation. Is any, are there any questions? Nobody? Okay. Blew through the second half pretty good, huh? <laughs> The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.